Welcome to the Plant Free MD podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Hey guys, just want to take a second to thank our sponsor at Carnivore Bar. I don't promote many products because honestly, all you need to be healthy is to just eat meat. For those times that you're out hiking, road tripping, or stuck at work and you want a nutritious snack that is just meat, fat, and salt if you want it, the Carnivore Bar is a great option. So I like this product not because it's just pure meat, but also because I want the Carnivore Market to thrive as well. And the more we support meat-only products, the more meat-only products that will be available in the mainstream. So if this sounds like something you'd like to get behind, check it out using my discount code ANTHONY to get 10% off, which also applies to subscriptions, giving you 25% off total. All right. Thanks guys. Hey everyone. This is uh, Dr. Anthony Chafee here again with another episode of the Plant Free MD. And uh, today I have a special guest, uh, Mr. Craig Emmerich, uh, who is, uh, as most people know, the husband of um, Maria Emmerich. They've both teamed together to put out some really great content and uh, a number of cookbooks as well. So Craig, thank you very much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me on, Anthony. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure. Um, so, can for people that don't uh, don't know about you, haven't come across you before, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and what you do? Yeah, we have a kind of a long story, but I'll I'll make it short. Uh, my wife, about twenty years ago, twenty two years ago, uh, had some health issues. Um, she had PCOS, she had acid reflux, uh, IBS, uh, and extra weight that she just couldn't get rid of, even though she was following all the traditional advice of you know, healthy whole grains and low fat and, you know, uh, running marathons, exercising more, just couldn't lose the extra weight, had all these health issues that never went away. She went to the doctor and they said, these are the cards you're dealt. And that was it, you know, like, here's some medications to take, you know, for the, these symptoms. Uh, and literally that same week after going to that doctor, our dog was losing patches of, of its hair. And so we, she took it into the vet. And the first thing that vet asked was, what are you feeding it? And it was like a light bulb moment for her. Of, My doctor never asked me what I ate. Not, not one question, you know, it just offered up these prescriptions. And so she started going down this rat hole of just every piece of nutrition, education, studies, books she'd get her hands on. Um, she started reading them. She went to school, edu- uh, uh, university for uh, nutrition, but that was a lot of the same food pyramid and that kind of talk. So she uh, mostly on her own, educated herself, implemented on herself, and she saw huge improvements, you know, when she started following low carb and and eventually all the way to carnivore on and off now, just kept seeing health improvements. And, you know, we've, we started helping clients uh, 20 years ago and maybe 12, 12, 14 years ago, started writing books about it and rest is history. (laughs) Yeah, very good. And, uh, and you, I understand you came, you sort of had, had a transition over to carnivore that was quite interesting as well. Uh, you didn't, yeah. you know, um, necessarily have all the same problems that, that uh, Maria did, but uh, can you walk us through your, your sort of journey there? Yeah, definitely. I was, you know, she had the pressing need because of the health issues at the time. And at the time I had no health issues. I had, you know, 20, 30 pounds of extra weight. I probably could have got rid of, but wasn't too concerned about it. I was, you know, I have my German background. I love brewing beer and these things that, uh, you know, I didn't really want to give up yet. Uh, and, and so I just, uh, just ate what she would make for me. And then on the weekends, eat, eat whatever I want. And I just, it got to the point where I just realized how crappy I felt on the weekends, you know, and after, I don't know, four or five years after she kind of started down this, uh, diet lifestyle, I came around finally and just started eating this way all the time that, you know, I lost, lost the extra weight. I had the extra energy, you know, all the things that, you know, mental clarity and the things you can, you know, of a keto type diet, you can see or carnivore. Um, about eight, nine years ago, I started having this pain in my back and it moved up through my back into my shoulders, neck. And around that time, we, I started researching carnivore more and, uh, you know, some of the, uh, I, I, you know, long story short, but, uh, I found out, eventually that I had Lyme disease. Um, and I re- in my researching, uh, we found out that uh, Charlene Anderson, as somebody I came across, who's been kind of over, I think, t- I don't know, 20 years now, she's been kind of, and yeah. it was started to deal with her chronic Lyme disease pain. Um, so I, 
you know, I didn't eat a lot of plants at the time. So I just decided let's eliminate the rest of the plants and see how it goes. And I, I had a big improvement in my pain. Um, and so like it, it ended, ended up kind of evolving for myself to finding my solution for my issues. And, and for me, it was carnivore. Yeah. And then, and that seems to have helped your, your Lyme disease. Are you, are you feeling? It has helped. Uh, the, well, you know, what's interesting about it, it's, it's almost like a blessing and a curse a little bit in that you know, we have clients all the time that we come to us with Lyme disease and just going from standard American diet to keto, they see big improvements, right? And I think what happened with me is it, it enabled me to go so long without really addressing the issue. Mm -hmm. And the thing with Lyme disease is if you don't uh, get it right away, that's when it becomes chronic and you get all these other issues that creep in, heavy metals, mold, you know, all these problems. Um, and because I was able to manage the pain for so long, because I was already keto for, you know, I've been keto for, I don't know, 15 years or something. Um, that I think made it worse than it needed to be. And so by the time I, you know, started going carnivore, it does help for sure with the pain, but it's not addressing the root cause, right? It's not getting rid of the Lyme disease. It's not getting rid of the mold issues. Uh, and so I've been down a path of last three or four years doing you, you absolutely name it of uh, uh, every treatment, traditional and non, uh, for Lyme disease, uh, I, and uh, myself, I've actually recently been uh, diagnosed with uh, ankylosing spondylitis, oh, really? which was, I, I believe, was derived from the Lyme because the Lyme, the chronic inflammation uh, that I was happen having, and what happens with a lot of Lyme patients is it triggers autoimmune reaction because the, the, the uh, immune response is like in overdrive all the time. And then that eventually that starts attacking healthy cells and you get autoimmune reaction. And, you know, a lot of people get MS or other things that really started with a, a Lyme issue. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't treat Lyme disease myself, but it's, um, it's something that you, you're aware of. This is a very, very difficult thing to treat. And most people just have to suffer with it their whole life. So at least this is something that you know, is at least getting some headway on and hopefully we'll, we'll clear up eventually. I'm very sorry to hear that, but, um, it is, yeah. it, it does give you a, um, you know, a, a much more stronger reason for, for eating clean because, you know, presumably if you sort of step outside of that, you'll have worsening symptoms. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. If I, if I introduce too many plants, I'll, my, my pain will flare up. My joint pain will flare up. It, it, yeah, I definitely notice it. And no, that kind of feedback's great to keep you on track, but it's also, you know, <laughs> kind, of, kind of sucks. But, yeah. um, you know, I, you know, one of the things we wrote in our book, uh, when we, you know, this right around the same time as we, I got diagnosed and I was doing all this research, um, uh, with Lyme, we started writing this book, uh, the carnivore cookbook. And it's not just the cookbook, like half the book is science and, we, we even uh, talk about our carnivore autoimmune protocol, which is basically an elimination protocol, which when I look at carnivore, I mean, there's a lot of great benefits to, to you know, animal proteins. And I'm sure you've covered, you've covered a lot of that on your show in the past and the nutrient density and all these uh, of the protein. But um, one of the things I look at it is it's a great tool as well for those with disease, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's one aspect like Dr. Sean, our friend, Sean Baker, he's, uh, you know, doing incredible performance and, you know, it, things, incredible things with carnivore from, the, from that perspective, but it, it can also be a really great tool for chronic disease and great tool for digestive issues and, you know, Lyme disease and all of these other conditions. Um, and so we wrote in this book, uh, kind of a, uh, it's like a, the ultimate elimination diet, right? You start just with beef, beef and salt, and then maybe you add, add in some other animal proteins and start working your way up the tree of, what can my body handle, you know, given my current state? And so it, it was, it was close to home for me because I, I you know, I kind of had to do the same thing myself to find what I could tolerate. Yeah. Well, I think, <clears throat> I think you're exactly right. You know, that, um, that it is, it is the ultimate elimination. It just gets down to just the pure basics. What, this is what we need for life. And then you can sort of branch out from there. And some people can handle more than other people. And some people can, I mean, I'm, I'm not very sensitive to a lot of things. I could eat a lot of it. I can certainly eat all the meats. I don't have a problem with dairy and, um, you know, some spices and things like that mix in. I don't have a huge problem with it, but it, I don't feel as good as I would. My face may get a bit 
itchy or like a stuffy nose or something like that. And I just see that as a sign is like, okay, well, that's doing something in my body that I don't want. And even though it's not giving me Lyme disease, I'm not, it, you know, it's still something I don't want. Um, but, you know, some people really, really have to be very sensitive. And that's something I've noticed as well with people with autoimmune uh, issues, especially that yeah. quite often they really can't even stray away from just beef. I mean, they, they, they have quite a problem with pork and chicken even, and certainly dairy. Yeah. Is, that, is that something you've noticed as well? Yeah, definitely. You know, we have, uh, we know people that uh, treat, they have uh, bipolar and they treat it with carnivore and right. they can even get into the spice. Like you were talking, some of the spices, mm -hmm. too much of that will start to trigger symptoms that were basically in remission, you know, eating just the uh, animal proteins. So yeah, it's definitely, and that's, then that's why we, you know, talked about in the book, we, we created three levels to start with for carnivore and, you know, level one is beef and salt. And it's like, okay, now you're, you're at the most basic level. And, you know, a lot of people who talk about carnivore and being carnivore are really kind of carnivore adjacent, you know, they'll, they'll include, you know, mushrooms or they'll include some, you know, ketchup on their burger, right? That's tomatoes, you know, those kind of things, right? Um, and when you get to chronic disease, you really got to, you got to define it as I'm starting with beef and salt and that's our level one. And then we had a level two, which you move into, which incorporates, you know, the other animal proteins. Uh, and sometimes you even got to go as basic as starting with other ruminants, you know, start with hmm. elk or, or venison or bison and, and work up that way. And then maybe some seafood or fish or, you know, and then start working through those. Uh, and then you move to, for us, we define level three as adding dairy and eggs. Cause those are two that, you know, certain people can have issues with, especially dairy. I mean, dairy is one of the most common allergens or sensitivities out there. Um, and then, uh, level four is like, you know, you start introducing maybe some spices and those kind of things. And so this book is, if you have autoimmune conditions and certain, uh, things like that, we really stuck to that with this book in that there's a lot of recipes that are just you know, proteins and salt. And, and we were real mindful about that, about not adding too much. Cause we, we do know that it can affect people. Oh, really good. And, um, that's interesting. You go, you go into the science about it too, and sort of explaining this. I know that, um, you did a talk, um, the ketocon 2020 was like when it was like virtual and yeah. 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 And, and you spoke actually, sorry, that's, uh, you know, a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart, which is all the different, you know, plant toxins and uh, anti-nutrients that exist in there. Um, you know, that, that's something that, that so many people uh, are really becoming newly aware of, but that was, that was the reason that I went carnivore, you know, 22 years ago was because it was just like, well, these are, these are awful. I don't want, I don't want any of that stuff in my body. Um, yeah. And it's great that you, you uh, have come, you know, looked into that as well, because so many people look at me and be like, you're just making this stuff up. And it's like, there's an entire branch of, of biology called botany that this is, this is, this is a hard science. This is, these are just facts. Um, yeah. How did, how did you come across that yourself? And, uh, and you know, can you tell us a bit, a bit more about that? I think, uh, gosh, I don't know how many years ago it was now, seven, eight years ago. I think the first introduction I had to it was Dr. Georgia Ede, mm -hmm. who has become a, a good friend of ours. Um, she, she, uh, I saw one of her initial presentations on vegetables, just saying, are these really good for us kind of thing, you know, and talking about all those compounds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, oxalates and glucosinolates and all these com compounds that are in these plants that, you know, maybe they're not the best thing for us. And and granted, uh, you know, if you've got a strong immune function, again, if you, if, you know, if I didn't have Lyme disease and I didn't have, you know, earlier on in my, my life, when I didn't have these issues, I can handle more of those plant toxins and my body could de detoxify them and get rid of them because they they're they're anti-nutrients because they're not used by the body that's you know definition of anti-nutrient right the body has to get rid of them and so at, at some point it's got to detox and get rid of these things these compounds that it doesn't need or want and so uh, people uh, can tolerate different levels and if you start getting to metabolic disorders uh, you know autoimmune conditions different things like this where you've already got a depressed immune function or, or you've got these issues going on, adding another load. And, that, and that's my theory on it. Why it inflames me more is because I already have this load of issues and inflammation I have to deal with. When you add another incremental amount of inflammation and things to detox and deal with in the body and anti-nutrients, anti it's just too much. You know, it's just too much for 
the body to handle and, and the pain flares up and all these issues creep up. Yeah. And then, you know, and, and also some of these things will cause direct harm and direct damage as well as, um, you know, blocking certain nutrients and, and being like a, you know, uh, an anti-nutrient in the sense that it actually stops us from gaining nutrition normally from, from the food that we're eating as well. So exactly the you know, the, in that presentation, I had the chart of, um, showing uh, zinc absorption. So there's a, uh, this was done where they checked blood plasma. So they look at the blood at, after eating and they checked it a, a couple times, different intervals. And they looked at how much zinc was actually getting into the bloodstream. Cause it's, you're not what you eat. You are what you absorb. Right. And if you're not getting it into the bloodstream and it's going right through you, or you're not absorbing it into the bloodstream, you're not eating it, right? You're not, you're not actually getting any benefit from that. And so they looked at uh, oysters, which are a great source of zinc. And they, uh, if you just ate the oysters, you had this nice increase in uh, blood zinc levels where you had a lot of zinc coming into the bloodstream. If you ate those same oysters with black beans, it was like half as much zinc that actually got into the bloodstream. And then when you ate a corn tortilla chips, none of the zinc ended up in the bloodstream. It was like a flat line that none of it got in. And so what happens with these anti-nutrients, especially like oxalates, they like to bind to things uh, like magnesium, like calcium, zinc. And when they bind to them as they're being detoxed out of the body, they rob the body of those nutrients. And so um, that's one of the big problems. Yeah, like you, like you point out, is not only can they be harmful in, in and of themselves, they can actually rob the body of essential nutrients. Yeah. And um, you know, one thing you mentioned as well in there, there was actually cases where people had toxic levels as, as in fatal levels of just oxalates. And, possible, and yeah. yeah, and that's what, what people don't, don't understand. They, you know, they're, since this is becoming a bit more, well, it, the, the information has sort of been a bit more spread out there and people are understanding that there are these natural toxins in plants. There have been, people in this space, you know, running counter to this, this sort of uh, message saying, yeah, look, they use these defense chemicals, but they're really nothing. They don't cause a problem. They're really not a, a, any sort of issue. Um, and that, you know, really, this is, just, this is really just, you know, more uh, hysteria and, and getting a bit out of control. But, you know, when, when you're talking about something that you can actually have a fatal dose of just by eating green smoothies, that that's yeah. clearly uh, you know, more of an issue than, than, uh, people are trying to make it out to be. Exactly. And, um, uh, one of the things that was interesting for us and we, you know, I think one of the reasons we have a really strong following is we don't stick to any dogma or, mm -hmm. you know, like any method just by, uh, because that's what we promoted in the past. Uh, we go where the science kind of leads us and we're always learning, you know, I, I coming from an engineering background, I was an electric, electrical engineer for a lot of years. And one thing I learned real fast in that field was if you didn't study up on the latest technology coming out six months, you're out obsolete. Like you always got to keep up on it. And that we've tried to do, I've, I've tried to do that, you know, in this nutrition space as well. And one of the things, you know, early on in the days of keto, promoting keto, we would, we always wanted to prioritize protein. We always kept that, you know, as a, as, as a principle, but we, you know, we would create a lot of, you know, almond flour desserts and, you know, talk about eating lots of dark leafy greens. And, you know, and when you think about keto, a lot of people that is keto, right? You're eating your almond flour based, you know, cakes and desserts and muffins and stuff. And, and you're eating your, your, your kale or your spinach. Those are some of the highest oxalate foods there are. And, you know, when we learn this, we, really evolved away from a lot of a lot of those uh, ingredients i think they can still be you know an occasional treat you know like in, in christmas time and if you're especially if you have like us we have kids and when we want to keep them low sugar and and, and low uh grain you know, grain and all that kind of stuff and so you know we use them with our sons you know as treats uh, but it's not a daily thing it's not even probably a monthly thing you know around here uh you know it's it's a special treat and I think that's where you, you need to treat it. And, and if you've got autoimmune conditions and issues, it's, it's you know, off limits. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think that, you know, like you said, they're learning that there's actually a toxicity level. And plus, you know, a lot of people, uh, we started connecting the dots on with kidney stones. You know, most kidney stones are calcium oxalate kidney stones. 
and they blame like calcium, like it's the problem here. And it's like, no, it's the oxalates are grabbing onto the calcium yeah. and they accumulate in the kidney and create the stone. Uh, it's the oxalate that's a problem. Uh, and so my wife actually had it happen to herself. She had a kidney stone and she started, she switched from almond milk and, and some of these things to, you know, other sources with lower in oxalates. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a funny thing too. I, I've never really thought of kale as a treat, you know, just like <laughs> once a year, like, oh, have some kale as a treat. And like, that's, you know, it was a treat when I didn't have to have kale generally. Yeah. <laughs> well, we did when they were really young, we made kale chips where you like, right. dehydrate them, put salt on them. They weren't too bad then. The boys kind of like uh, crunching on them every once in a while, but we don't yeah. eat them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I noticed that too, that when, when people will go keto, They'll, they'll eat more vegetables than they've ever eaten in their, in their entire life because they think that, okay, it's like, oh, wait, well, I'll cut out the, car, the carbs and grains, but you know, this is where I'm going to get all my nutrients is all, all from the greens and everything like that. And, uh, and I, I think that some people actually, well, they talk about a keto flu. I don't know um, what your thoughts on that are, but you know, I think sometimes when people are eating just so much more of these you know, oxalates and other sorts of defense chemicals, that they might actually make them feel pretty crummy. And obviously you can have withdrawals from, from sugar and different sorts of things, but I think it might actually be part of that is that they're eating so much more of this stuff that they've never exposed themselves to. And it makes them feel kind of gross. Well, and it, and you see a lot of the keto flu, they might get a, a, a rash or break out, mm. you know, on their skin. That could just be oxalate dumping. And, and like you said, yeah. from those bad situations, but I think a lot of time the, the bad, the actual bad feeling that people get with the keto flu is typically electrolyte electrolyte imbalance. You know, okay. carbohydrates retain water into the body, and then you flush out the uh, you you stop eating the carbohydrates. You flush out that retained water, which is good. You don't want all that water retention. But with the water goes any water coming out of the body, electrolytes go with. Uh, and so you uh, people if they are more mindful about their electrolytes when they especially in the first couple of weeks of starting out, usually mm -hmm. that helps as well. Okay, well that's good to know too. Um, so you were talking uh, as well about um, if you guys do a version of like a protein sparing, it's a protein sparing modified fasting. Am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is another one. Interesting. It's it's kind of a medical term uh, mm -hmm. that was developed, but you know, we we were doing this with our clients, you know, fifteen plus years ago. But at the time, we didn't know the medical term of protein sparing modified fast, and Marie just called them pure protein days you know, do a pure, pure, pure protein day, but basically little to no carbs, uh, a lot less dietary fat, but lots of protein. So you're still hitting your, you know, protein goal where you're getting enough protein for your lean mass and size. Cause protein intake is very variable by based on the person activity level goals. So, you know, somebody, a five foot tall woman is going to have a way different protein goal than you know, a six foot tall man who's a bodybuilder, right? I mean, it's gonna be, so you really gotta base it on the, the lean mass and the size of the person. But protein sparing basically hits that goal. And then the fuels, right? Protein by itself is usually not used as a fuel. It's only used as a fuel in last resort, meaning you're not eating any fuels, you're not eating any carbs, fat, or alcohol, and you don't have a lot of fuel on your body. So if you're a lean person and you're doing, protein sparing where you're eating almost no fat and carbs, the body's forced to turn that protein into glucose to get some fuel, right? That's the only time it really uses protein in any significant amount for, to make glucose. Um, if you have enough body fat, i.e. you're trying to lose weight, doing a protein sparing modified fast will just force the body to tap more body fat for fuel. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really, you know, it's a powerful tool for speeding up weight loss, for breaking a stall. Uh, if you've been stalled for a few months, you know, with weight loss, um, we don't recommend it for everyone. You know, like I said, if you're a lean person, you shouldn't be doing them. Uh, if you maybe have uh, some certain conditions like Alzheimer's or bipolar or certain things where elevated blood ketones may be beneficial. So more dietary fat, you know, leading to, to higher blood ketones it's probably not a good tool for you either. Um, but for a lot of people uh, that are looking for weight loss, which is a lot of people in this community, it can be a, a powerful tool, but we also limit it in that we say add maybe one to three days a week of protein sparing days. And then your kind of regular weight loss macros and maybe even an overfeeding day uh, in the week 
because it is pretty low calorie. I mean, you know, a typical person with 100 grams of protein um, for a, say a five foot two woman, it might be shooting for 100 grams of protein. That's 400 calories. If mm. you're only getting 30 grams of fat with that, you know, you, in 10 grams of carbs, say, you might be 700 calories, and that's a really low calorie day. So you don't want to be doing that all the time. Just we look at it as uh, a substitute for a, a water fast. Some people will do, you know, nothing but water for a day or two days. Well, in place of that, and to prevent your body from losing muscle, you do a protein sparing modified fast, which is where the term comes from. Modify a fast to spare your body's protein. Yeah, there was actually, um, you know, I've always been quite interested in in the differences between actually fasting, actually you know, depriving yourself of nutrition and just being in a so-called fasting metabolism, which I don't, I don't think is a fasting metabolism. I mean, you eat 4,000 calories in ribeye, you're obviously not fasting. So, and why are you still in a fasting metabolism? It's not a fasting metabolism. I, I think that's our primary met metabolic state. And I think we just get a lot of benefits from being in that, that metabolic state. And then you derange that by eating carbohydrates. Um, and so some of these things, we have a lot of studies looking at fasting and obviously shows a lot of benefit. And then some people that are detractors of keto or carnivore, they say, oh, well, this is just mimicking fasting. And we know fasting is really good for you. And so, you know, that's all it's doing is mimicking fasting. It's like, or fasting gets you into the metabolism that you're supposed to be in any way. And you would be in if you were eating your natural diet, really. Yeah. It? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, there are certain little aspects that, you know, there's been studies that show that keto increases autophagy. Autophagy is the body's process for breaking down cells and building newer, younger cells with those, uh, with those parts. Um, it does increase autophagy, which is something that increases a lot on fasting too. So, I mean, there are some little parallels there, but it's not fat. I mean, you're not mimicking a fast. It's yeah. Uh, when I think of a fast, I think of it from an energy standpoint, right? And that's why a protein sparing modified fast is kind of mimicking a fast from an energy standpoint mm. because energy in the diet's way down. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I, I even looked at some of those, some of those studies to try to look at, you know, because there are like the fasting mimicking diets and they, they say, okay, does this get the same effect as, as fasting? And quite a lot of them have not only the same effects as fasting, as it just depriving yourself of nutrition, but yeah. um, actually have better, do better than, than uh, the fasting group. And one of them was uh, in a group just, you know, just you talk about, you know, having a hundred grams of, uh, of protein, just sort of, you know, maybe remember this, uh, where it spoke about actually fasting and then sort of like a modified fast where they were at least sort of give some protein. And, yeah. um, and they found that, that with, as, with at least a hundred grams of protein a day, that, that, that sort of, you know, kept people quite, pretty healthy for, more extended fasts and the, and the longer fasts where they didn't have any, any protein or anything at all. Uh, that was where people saw more issues, some side effects, such as like hair loss. Not everyone was getting this, but there was just an increased prevalence of these sorts of, uh, of side effects. Is that, is that something you've, you've, uh, been aware of as well? Uh, definitely. You know, one of the things with keto that we see all the time is people, when they go keto, a lot of times they will have some hair loss. Mm. Um, some of it is, you know, any major change in diet, you, you will, a lot of times you'll see some hair shedding. Um, mm. So it's kind of just big diet shift and your body starts, the hair follicles are pushing out the old ones. And it's kind of a process the body goes through with a big, big change in diet. Uh, but a lot of times it's because they're not eating enough protein. Mm. Um, you see, a lot, there's a lot of keto promoters and people out there who talk about, you have to have 80% of the diet being fat. And that's a therapeutic approach to keto or carnivore where you're treating it, it originated with epilepsy where kids needed, you know, yeah. like 80% fat from the diet to treat epilepsy. And that's some of the original keto diet. Um, and, and that, that has application for those situations. But if you're in a weight loss situation, not only does 80% fat not help, uh, as much with weight loss because the fat in the diet is going to end up in your fat cells anyway. Uh, it also lit, it ends up with people, especially a lot of women, uh, not getting enough protein. And so they'll end up eating, you know, 50 grams of protein. And now they start losing hair because you're not getting enough protein in the diet. And then most of the time, those uh, women, when they up protein to maybe 100 grams, um, 
and cut down the fat a bit because you know you can only eat so much uh they end up having a lot less hair loss and see improvements there yeah that was what um uh, I was speaking to you, uh, coach Bronson about, and, and the, sort of the way he approached it was say, Hey, you, you don't need to get this percentage or that percentage. You need to get yeah. enough protein. You need to get enough yeah. fat and whatever that shakes out to be percentage wise, you know, is what it is, but you need to get enough of these things. We're a huge proponent of, you know, grams of macros versus, uh, percentages because percentages yeah. are so prone to error based on calories. Right. I mean, if you're eating 4,000 calories a day, cause you're really active and all this stuff, your, you know, 10% carbs are going to be way different than somebody trying to lose weight and they're a smaller woman and they're, eat, you know, eating, you know, 1400 calories or something. You do, you figure it out. You're, you're eating a vastly, you know, 10 grams of carbs versus like 80 grams of carbs or something, you know? So, uh, you know, definitely prone to error if you're, if you're just counting percentages. Yeah. So what we- ignore the goals, like you're saying, like, a goal should be, I need enough protein for my body. Yeah. Whether I don't care what the percentage is based on how big I am and how much muscle I have, I need this much protein. Yeah. So what, what would be some, some, you know, grams per weight, I'm assuming that, that you would uh, have targets for people. Typically, uh, you know, we have a calculator on our website that kind of takes a bunch of different factors into play, but uh, a real easy kind of rule of thumb for a, a man Start at about 100 grams of protein at five foot tall, and then add like five grams of protein per inch above that. So if you're five foot six, uh, it'd be an extra 30. So at least 130 grams of protein a day, you know, would be your goal as a man. For women, we say about maybe 80 to 90 grams of protein is a starting point at five foot, and then add above that. Okay. And do you have any any sort of fat minimums as well, or is it mostly focused on on protein? You know, you do, for us, it's uh, too, kind of two pronged. Uh, on protein sparing days, we never want to go below like 20, 30 grams. And again, those are very occasional. Only It's only a tool if you're trying to break a stall or whatever, because you need about 20, 30 grams of fat just to get uh, a vitamin absorption, you know, A, D, E, and K to absorb fat soluble vitamins to make, you know, certain, certain hormones. You need some dietary fat. Even when it's a pulsed, you know, uh, transient of one day doing it, you still want to get some fat. Um, as far as day to day, then we look at it more from a calorie standpoint because uh, you don't want metabolic adaptation happening. Where you know, if you're eating really low calorie for extended periods of time, um, you're going to start downregulating your metabolism. And the, the studies, like the Biggest Loser study, you know, you've seen all of that information. So we kind of look at it more from that perspective, but in any case, it's hit your protein, keep carbs, you know, to a minimum, and then it just take your fat and adjust it based on your goals. You know, that becomes the only variable left. Right. And so you, you know, if you want to lose more weight down, dial it down a little bit. If you want to maintain, dial it up, you need more energy, dial it up a bit. If you're active, you know, that, that it's as simple as that. Okay, great. And, um, and so when you guys, uh, because I understand you guys um, treat clients uh, online just from, from all over the place and you and sort of, and you're, and you're coaching them in, you know, whatever direction they want to go. What, what sort of uh, is your, your normal clientele? Is this uh, is a lot to do with weight loss, chronic disease, or, or who are you normally seeing? Uh, we see the whole gamut, uh, everything. Uh, I would say, you know, almost, uh, gosh, I don't want. 95 plus percent do want at least one of their goals is weight loss, right? Yeah. You know, that's, you know, most people that come into this want to lose some weight, but the thing that's really interesting, and this has been true for the 20 years of doing this, people stick with this, not because of the weight loss, they stick with it because how they feel the, you know, energy they have, the mental clarity they have, the, you know, improvements they see in all these uh, autoimmune conditions or pain, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, you, you name it, digestive issues, all these improvements they see in their health is why they stick with it. The weight loss is kind of a side bonus, you know, to just how good they feel. And we actually have on our, our blog, <clears throat> excuse me, we have a uh, success stories. I put a little link right on the top. And if you click on the success stories, I put a page together of just a sampling of all these testimonies we've gotten over the years. And again, 20 years, you accumulate a lot of 
you know, in, uh, testimonies from different things. And so I started keeping them in this folder of ours. And at some point I was like, we got to get some of this out there for, so people will see what can happen with this. It's not just about weight loss. And so the first half is like weight loss stories of, you know, we have like a 250 pound club. People have lost over 250 pounds, no. over 200 pounds. Like there's do dozens of them. And then we got to the uh, 150 or a hundred pound club. We couldn't even list because there's, we just run out of page, you know, it's this huge page already. Uh, but then below that, I put health stories. And so we put, uh, it was originally from our slides, but I put the you know, snippets of the client testimonies of all these different health conditions from Parkinson's to MS to, you know, uh, all, obviously Alzheimer's and seizure control and diabetes, you know, things you typically think of. But uh, there's also all kinds of uh, digestive things like IBS, Crohn's, acid reflux, we, we, and a lot of times, you know, people say, well, you lose weight, you're going to see improvement in health. And, and in general, that's fairly true, you know, for most situations. Uh, but there's, we have testimonies on there of people gaining weight and having huge improvements in health. One is, one example is uh, one of our clients had really bad uh, cases of Crohn's and they were underweight. So they were like 89 pounds and had to gain weight wow. while, and they did, they gained weight and all their Crohn's symptoms went away, right? So it's not just the weight loss, right? There's more to it. There's a lot of health improvements you can see. And we've got, I don't know, tens of thousands of these now. And I can literally just go in that folder now and type in a condition and get half a dozen testimonies. It's just, wow. it's incredible. No, that's really amazing. And, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's nice that you have that database that you can refer back to as well, even just for, for data collection uh, purposes as well, because that's, I mean, tens of thousands of people, that, that, that's an incredible, uh, I mean, that's, that'd be a career for some people, you guys are still going, uh, but that's a huge amount of people that you've helped. And it's really, really important to uh, have that sort of collated data so that you can say like, hey, this is, we're seeing this in these numbers and, you know, like, all of our, all of these people that, and they're all responding in the same way. Obviously that's not the same as like a randomized controlled trial or anything like that, sure. but, you know, but a, a very large, you know, robust case series can still, um, you know, show a lot of very good information to people. And it's just, it's just more data collection to get, to yeah. get this word out there. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I originally started putting it together. Cause I was like, this is pretty powerful. If we can yeah. you know have three or four, eight or 10 examples of, this situation and they all saw this improvement. You know, I, I worked uh, in my later years as an engineer, I worked in uh, uh, healthcare informatics and then into uh, uh, imaging uh, software. Uh, and we did, you know, PET CT type imaging software. I actually, I actually did a calcium score myself once on our software and our training, you know. Uh, and, and what I found is that, you know, doctors, you know, one thing I don't like in this community is certain promoters and keto will be like, uh, you know, doctors are just want to keep you sick and keep you on a prescription. And, you know, that kind of a thing that some people get into. And mm. that is not the case on 99 point whatever percent of doctors, they want to help. Yeah. They want to see better outcomes with their patients and a better outcomes mean they left me in better health and in better shape than when they came. And yeah. they're just not given the tools in most cases you know, there's a, been a, there was a study in California that showed doctors on average got 24 hours to, uh, or less of nutrition education in all of their schooling, residency, et cetera, right? And a lot of that is, okay, how much glucose do I have to put in an IV to keep somebody in a coma alive, right? Like, you know, so they're not giving those the tools, right? And But they, they do want to help. And so by providing these kind of outcomes, uh, we've been working with our friend, uh, Dr. Eric Westman to get some of these out in case study papers, because mm. you're right, you know, N equals one, N equals many, you know, a few, it's a good example. And it's, it's, there's something there to, that should pique people's interest. Yeah. I was just going to ask if you were, if you, um, we're looking to get those published. Sometimes it's hard not being as, as um, you know, attached to an institution that's running these sorts of uh, series. Uh, but it, it would be great. I mean, if you have so many space, I mean, you just you just pick these different uh, maladies like Crohn's. You know, say, okay, well, we have seventy eight people with Crohn's, and and these are the these are the the the, the results of all of those people. 
you know, you can at least sort of get these things out there and, uh, and then people will have something to refer to in the literature. And then all of a sudden they'll have to start thinking like, okay, well, wait a minute, this is showing up more and more. Maybe we should, we, maybe we should look into this further. Yeah. Dr. Westman has been trying to do some more of that, uh, in his own patients, but also working with us and other people, because that's kind of what he's trying to do mm -hmm. is just get the info. We don't have, you know, I'm not able to fund and run a big study on this. So let's just get some case studies out there, get some yeah. stuff in the literature so that, you know, doctors going out there and looking and they see, oh, look at a couple of case studies here. Uh, there was one just recently by Dr. Georgia Ede with Dr. Westman, I believe, that talked about uh, all these improvements with uh, all these uh, patients who were having bipolar and different uh, uh, issues that medications weren't helping with. And all of them in this, I think there was 36 in this uh, of, of cases, all saw improvements across the board with diet changes. And so that's the kind of thing. If you get it out there, at least it's there for people to find and pique their interest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw that as well. Yeah. And it was like, it was bipolar, schizophrenia, major depression, anxiety, yeah, uh, sure. OCD. And they were yeah. all, and, and interestingly enough, these weren't just, just normal people that happened to have this malady. They were all refractory to standard of care. So the counseling yeah. and medications had all failed them. And then yeah. they put them just on a ketogenic diet, not even a full carnivore diet. Um, although I think sometimes now to just to get the, the study passed, they're calling it a, a keto diet, but it's actually carnivore. And so, yeah, you know, yeah. it was like, because keto, be carnivore is keto, it is a keto diet. And so, yeah, but yeah. Um, you know, there's nothing in the literature yet with carnivore on it, but uh, and it's also sort of a, of, um, a less scientific name, I guess you could say, but um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they, they all, they all improved all, all 30, I think it was, yeah, 30 something, 32, yeah, uh, like they, they all improved just by yeah. dietary changes alone when they were refractory <laughs> to traditional treatments, uh, which is, which is, should turn some heads, uh, you would hope. Absolutely. And, and, and everybody should want that, right? Because that's essentially free, right? You've got to eat yeah. something. So if you're just deciding to eat these foods instead of these foods, and you see huge improvements versus a medication that might cost you thousands of dollars or cost the healthcare system thousands of dollars a month. I mean, we should all want that. Yeah. And, and you know, in, in certain places, you know, that, that's, it's going to be hard to get those studies out there because obviously you're not going to have a pharmaceutical company that's going to spend millions of dollars to show that you don't need their pharmaceutical. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but you, you would imagine that in, 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 you know, university institutions and, uh, and especially like around the world, like I'm in Australia and they have, you know, they have, you know, socialized healthcare here. Uh, a lot of drawbacks to that system. One you would think would be that they would want to spend less, right? Yeah. Because the government does as much as they can to not spend money on you. And that ends up being, uh, you have six year waiting list until you come in to see someone in, uh, you know, surgical specialty to, you know, to help you with whatever your problem. And like, actually, like actually six years, like I'm not making wow. that up. Like this is actual like USSR, like wait times, you know, where you, you put your money in ahead of time and it's like, okay, yeah, come back in six years, you'll get your car. Um, wow. th that's not happening with cars, but you know, that is happening with healthcare. And, uh, but you would, you would imagine that, you know, because they're looking for every opportunity to not pay as much or, or even insurance companies as well, they don't want to pay for these, these really expensive medications. You'd think that it would be in their best interest to look at these options, say, Hey, we don't have to pay anything. You just change your diet. And, um, and so I think that that might be an angle, but I think everyone has their influences as well. And, yeah, and definitely. Well, and, and the problem is back to the, you know, what the doctors seeing day to day in the U S anyway, uh, I know doctors who they, and they, they see this in their practice where if they spend 10 minutes with a patient and give them two prescriptions versus an hour talking about diet, talking about lifestyle, they'll get reimbursed more from insurance mm. from a 10 minute visit with two prescriptions. And they will from the hour spent on lifestyle and diet you know, recommendations. So yeah. that you're incentivized to do the right thing and spend the time, you know, to do the right thing. It's crazy. Yeah. I ended up, I ended up just staying late, unfortunately. And <laughs> just because like, I, you know, I think that it's uh, important to talk about these things, but that's, that's actually why I started 
uh, YouTube channel was just because like, I, you know, it's not really the place for me to talk about all these sorts of things when I'm seeing somebody um, or, or I don't have the time and uh, we have, and we have to cover other things. And so, you know, I have this as, as a resource for people to, to just check out and, and see what they think and, um, you know, come to their own conclusions. But uh, yeah, you're right. You know, it, it, it's the incentives are in the sort of the wrong direction. You're incentivized to sort of just, just write a prescription, get someone out the door and just move on to the next patient as opposed to really sit down and say, okay, hey, this is how you need to address this. And this is, and this, this will help you. Yeah, it's, it's really upside down. You know, you're, we're in uh, band-aids on symptoms, you know, with prescriptions versus treating root causes yeah. and, and never going to get, a, you know, the band-aids is always going to be required if you don't treat the root cause, you know? And so you, you end up on a lifetime of prescriptions when if you treat the root cause, you could be off, not only reverse the symptoms, but, you know, not require any medication. So it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. If we can go that route, it's just hard with the system, the way it's set up. Yeah, it is. There was, um, uh, Professor Thomas Seafried from Boston College, he was saying, it's like, as soon as we figure out uh, an, an economic model that would incentivize these sorts of conversations, you know, just, you know, just talking about like, hey, you know, do these things and you don't need healthcare, you know, that's when we, that's when we'll be able to uh, be able to, to, to sort of grow this sort of idea of these dietary lifestyle changes, radically changing our health, which, which is, you know, that, that's, that's something that, we understand. I mean, think about it this way: like we we talk, we've been talking for the last fifty years, eat less, move more, right? And then we'll lose weight. So that hasn't worked. You know, we've been eating the wrong things, and um, and you know, probably moving about the same. But you know, yeah. the um, the the idea that fat and saturated fat caused heart disease that's been under that's been you know thought to be true for at least 50 years. So the idea that some of the food that we're eating is causing these chronic diseases isn't, isn't a new one. We just yeah. need to sort of change the direction of ire and, um, and understanding as well, because you know, it's not that it's, it's something else. Yeah. Uh, in our keto book that we wrote like eight, nine years ago, I started out with a kind of, uh, a, a overview of a case of how, the sugar industry lobby or paid for all these studies to be done. And, and these are out now that actually even more of them, uh, these letters and, and data has come out since we wrote that book of how they funded, they, they knew that sugar was the problem. They knew that sugar was one of the big causes of heart disease. They wouldn't, they needed the finger to be pointed at someone else. So they funded these studies to get the connection to saturated fat to heart disease. And, and it was like, you know, the, the cigarette industry level of, you know, we know where the problem, but we're going to misdirect this. And we, you know, 30, 40 years later, we're, we're still in that place, right? Like with a lot of healthcare and that, which is absolutely, even though all this has come out now, uh, that, that they were actually mis, uh, leading people to go down this wrong path, you know, and, and, and from a, you know, what you talked about incentivizing, you know, to go that way in the U S we still spend billions on corn subsidies. Right. So we're actually artificially lowering basically high features corn syrup because that's what where most of the corn ends up. Right. It basically just turns into starch and then they use make corn syrup or high fructose corn syrup from it. We're making that an artificially cheap thing through subsidies. Yeah. I mean, we should be doing the opposite. Right. I mean, we should be adding cost to corn, corn and corn syrup and, you know, de using that money to, uh, you take protein and, and beef and lean protein or uh, animal proteins and reduce the cost. But, you know, we're going in the opposite direction of a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, I saw a, uh, someone sent me, you know, sent me this, this video and, and asked me sort of, well, how, how would you approach this? There was a doctor and, and he was very earnest and, and I'm sure very well-meaning. And she said that, you know, before she was a doctor, she was a patient, she had lupus, she had all these problems and, you know, going through all her medical school and, you know, training in you know, advanced degrees in genetics and all that sort of thing. So she couldn't figure out how to actually just be healthy. And then, you know, 
15 years ago, she turned to a vegan diet. She's never had a problem since she's been off her medication. She's helped all these people. And the point that I made to them was that, well, there are plenty of people that are on a vegan diet that are overweight and very sick and have lupus and have all these other things. The, what the difference is, is that you know, when you talk to someone who goes vegan, they have, and they have uh, improvements in their health. It's not, they're not just dropping meat. They're not still eating ice cream and cookies and cake and drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes. They're, they're eating whole foods. They're not going out to eat. They've cut out sugar. They're not drinking sodas. They're not drinking alcohol. They don't smoke. And so obviously there are more changes being done there. And what you can see is like, you know, there are some vegans, vegan is just a meaningless term. It just means don't eat meat, but it doesn't mean what you do, not your, what you're supposed to do. And so, you know, some people go vegan and they're just as sick or even more sick. And then some people get better, but basically everyone who gets everyone I know have heard of who goes carnivore gets better as well. So what that means is you're, you're cutting out certain plant foods and you're getting yeah. better. Some of these things are triggering uh, these diseases and these, these chronic uh, diseases, mostly the sugar the processed garbage and carbs and things like that. And yeah. that you can, you can eliminate those things out through either method, but you are still eliminating out the plants and the sugar as opposed to meat, eliminating meat isn't going to get you there. It's eliminating the plants. Well, the the pro, yeah, the processed foods and the yeah. sugars, right? But, you know, you go from the standard American diet to pretty much anything else that's whole foods based. I don't care what it becomes, but anything mm -hmm. whole foods, you're going to see health improvements. You yeah. you are. I mean, you're basically going from the worst possible diet <laughs> out there to the standard American diet to something that's whole foods, which is better. Um, you know, I, I would argue that I don't think anybody can truly thrive for the long term without animal proteins. Um, and it's not just the complete protein, you know, that is so hard to get in the plant world without a lot of, you know, co compromised foods like soy with, mm -hmm. uh, phytoestrogens and, and those type of issues with it. Um, but also because of the vitamins and minerals and, this is something that we've been putting in our books too. Uh, a whole chapter I put dedicated to this in our keto book like eight years ago, because at that point I'd been in nutrition for quite a while and I didn't even realize how much vitamins and minerals there were in just beef, right? Like it's not, it wasn't, you know, eight years ago, it, nobody really understood that a steak has more vitamins and minerals than kale or blueberries or any of these superfoods, you know, mm -hmm. that were been told there are these superfoods. And so we started, I just, it, it just blew my mind. So I started making these charts and I'm like, okay, let's, let's take uh, beef and compare it against kale and, and, and apple, you know, apple a day, it keeps the doctor away. Right. And, and all these things. And it was just blowing them out of the water on every, uh, like the 13 most essential vitamins and minerals across the board. And then you add something like beef liver and it's like the beef yeah. liver is probably the most nutrient dense food on the planet. And yeah. you talk about health. And you talk about healing and what's going to help with that. It's going to be nutrient dense foods. Like you give, you give me a plate and don't tell me what's on either plate, but you say they're both the same calories. One of them has like almost no vitamins and minerals, maybe like one vitamin that's high and the rest are nothing. Another one that's really high across the board, all vitamins, and minerals, same calories, which one's going to be healthier for you? Mm -hmm. The one that's more nutrient dense. And that's beef. That's your animal proteins. And this other thing over here is kale. It's got like one vitamin really high and everything else is, you know, that or like an apple. It's got like vitamin C and then everything else is very little, you know. So uh, that's why we started putting these charts together. And it really opened my eyes. And uh, again, back to what's going to help you be satiated and what's going to help you be healthy and heal if you've got issues. It's going to be really nutrient dense foods. And it's going to be uh, complete proteins because what's healing, what's building our cells, a lot of that's protein. And so I look at the animal proteins as essential for those building blocks of amino acids, but also for all the vitamins and minerals they come with. Yeah. And, and that's something that I, I always think about as well, just sort of getting on the first principles, just, you know, the basics is we, what are we trying to do when we we're trying to build and maintain meat? So what's going to have yeah. everything that we need? to do that meat, right? You'd think, right? So these are animal, animal tissue and, and some animals are able to convert plant tissue into animal tissue. And that's, that's miraculous. We're not so great at it. I mean, we can, but it's not, it's not, we're not perfect at it. And I think that brings us 
to uh, you know the issue of bioavailability, which is that these the the kale and all these other things may have all these nutrients in them, but they're not necessarily accessible to us. Is that right? Exactly. Like uh, for example, spinach. Everybody's like, oh, spinach really high in calcium. Well, that's that's great. Guess what? It's also high in oxalates. Yeah. Well, the oxalates do rob you of the calcium. And oh, and they bind to it and cause kidney stones, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's that whole, you know, uh, what you absorb is what's important, not necessarily what's in the food. Yeah. And that's, uh, and that's another sort of indication as to what we're supposed to eat and what, as you know, and, and what we're biologically adapted to eat. We can get everything, everything out of meat. Whereas in plants you have, you may have, you know, thiamine and calcium and, and all these sorts of things avail, you know, in there, but because they're, they're bound up in, in, in certain chemical bonds, we don't have the enzymes to break apart those bonds. And so what does that mean? That means that we are not biologically adapted or fit to eat and consume that product. And that, that seems to be a lot of these nutrients in plants. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, compounds too, that just aren't in the right form, right? Like mm. iron, iron from beef, your, the absorption rate is through the roof, you know, iron from like lentils is like a hundred times less absorb, you know, <laughs> available. Right. And so, you know, the, what you, it, 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 if it's got a lot of a compound that your body can't really use, how does that help us? Right. Yeah, exactly. That was, um, that was a great, a great example of that was, uh, uh, when I was speaking to Dr. Bill Schindler, he gave an example of corn, which has, you know, a ton of thiamine in it, except that it's bound up in a certain way that we can't, we can't extract it. And so people were dying on mass around Europe and America uh, from pellagra, which is a, was a thiamine deficiency, which is, which is ironic because there's a lot of thiamine in corn. It's just bound up in a way that we can't, we can't access it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, So that's sort of, you know, brings me to my next point is that the plants that we're eating now, A, obviously we're not biologically adapted to eat them because we can't even extract basic nutrients from them. Um, and sometimes you can, you can cook them or put them through, you know, nishtalmization, like with corn and put some chemical reactions to bring, bring out these nutrients. And people will say, well, that's, that's how we consume these. A, it's not always, but B, uh, if we are biologically adapted to eat them, we should have the mechanics to break them down and extract them. We should not have to use a chemical process or even heat extraction to, to break apart these defense chemicals and extract these nutrients. Um, yeah. But either way, these plants didn't exist 20,000 years ago. They're all, they're all you know, bioengineered in some form or another. Um, can you talk about that? I mean, because obviously, it, you know, if our ancestors weren't eating this 20,000, 50,000 years ago, why are we eating them now? Yeah, that's, you know, not just the... Uh... Uh, natural evolution, but also the hybridizing and crossbreeding and all these things we do, you know, even to this day that we're still doing, you know, I just not too long ago, they came out with cotton candy grapes that are uh, almost twice the sugar of normal grapes. Gross. Uh, the normal grapes of today, right? It, you never see a less sweet, <laughs> more advanced, bitter fruit or vegetable that they're hybridizing, mm-hmm. right? They're, they're crossbreeding and making these things always sweeter less nutrient dense, packed with sugar. Um, but also, you know, like you said, going back even, I think that what we, strawberry of today, it was like less than 200 years ago that they found this strain and they crossbred and they ended up, it used to be something, uh, you know, every two years, I believe it, it, it fruited and it was this you know, little tiny thing. And now you get ones the size of your hand. So it's, you know, not just a volume, you know, it's a volume thing. Uh, where you're getting more sugar uh, per volume and the volume itself is huge compared to what it used to be. I remember uh, we were up at uh, my father-in-law's cabin and we found some wild strawberries that grew up actually naturally in that area. And they're like these little pea-sized things. And you had to forage, you know, for the equivalent of one strawberry in the store, you had to forage for half an hour to find enough. And they're pretty bitter. You know, they weren't very sweet at all. Um, and so that's a, uh, one factor in it, but I also just recently saw a study, and I can give you a link if you want to put it in the notes. Uh, there's a study that showed that in the last 50 to 100 years, the fruits and vegetables that we consume just in the last 50 to 100 years have gone down in nutrient nutrients by 30%, in some cases, 40, 50, 
less nutrients because of depletions of the soil mm -hmm. and all these uh, uh, issues. And so, you know, we're just naturally getting this fruits and vegetables are getting less and less nutrient dense. Uh, and, and they didn't start out that great, you know, compared to something like beef. So, well, I like having the animal do the uh, concentrating for me of those things. Yeah, me too. And, and, uh, and uh, filtering out all the, the toxins as well. Um, yeah. I was looking at the, the dietary recommendations in the U S and now that it's come, you know, all across the world as well, it's now made it to the shores of Australia and to the hospitals here. So those, those dietary recommendations in the U S that are pretty appalling, they're now the official recommendations in our hospital system here. And I took a look at that and I, you know, me being me, I, you know, I had to write an email. I'm like, yeah, you actually, you know, <laughs> I've, been, I've been studying this for a while. And I, you know, I would just say, I have a couple issues with these sorts of things and, and, you know, cited things and put references and links and things like that. And um, in the green zone, basically the green zone was that you can eat as much of this as you want, whatever, just go to town. Uh, then the yellow zone was like still good for you, but, you know, use in moderation. Uh, and the red zone was like, don't just don't have this stuff. Or if you do just have it very sparingly. Um, so in the green zone, well, I'll tell you the red zone first was obviously, you know, ground beef, butter, eggs, right? Every, everything I eat, the old, basically exclusively what I eat. And, um, and then in the green zone, first of all, number one was watermelon. So out of a, a rating of a hundred, a hundred points, watermelon had 100. It is the perfect food, right? <laughs> so this is, this is, this is apparently according to these people, because that you know, hundred out of a hundred, what would that mean? I mean, like, this is what's yeah. biologically most appropriate for us. This is our optimal diet. You know, you have, you have animals in the zoo, you know, like this is what they eat and this is what they should only eat. So this is watermelon for us, apparently, according to the United wow. States uh, government and the, and the and now the Australian uh, government as well. Watermelon. We are watermelon of ores. That's what we should be eating. That's <laughs> the would, only thing we should ever eat. Well, get back to evolution, right? It used to be a, a thing with a hard shell. You had to crack it open like a chisel. It was like, this big. that's what a watermelon was until we read this thing that's filled with sugar right yeah i would love to know though where did they get that like what's the thing in watermelon that makes it so special i mean is it the sugar yeah <laughs> i mean what what there's no protein no there's I mean, that's just incredible yeah well there's, there's nothing useful you know and uh yeah i have no idea and and i don't i, I don't know what they what that number means what is it what is that show your work you know, I mean, like we, we've done, we've been doing this since kindergarten. It's like, Hey, you don't get any credit unless you show your work. All right. How did you, so come, up with this how did you come up that a watermelon was a hundred, you know? <laughs> and so hundred. Okay. So how are they figuring that out? I have no idea, but it, it gets better than that because number two with 97 uh, out of a hundred was canned peaches, canned <laughs> peaches. All right. It's not not even fresh possible. peaches. It's it's canned it, and high fructose corn syrup mixed yeah, in with it. Yeah. It's oh canned with, with, with sugar syrup. So I think, I think we know why. I think we know um, the more sugar in it, the better. Because number three, which I thought was very special, was frosted cornflakes. Oh, my. That is not that is, even cornflakes, but yeah, frosted cornflakes. Sugar covered one. Yeah. Frosted cornflakes was higher than Cheerios, unfrosted Cheerios. Right. So the was sugar there, made it better. Was there like a no Kellogg's, you know, made this list at the bottom or something? <laughs> well, I think there, I think there was uh, in the, you know, the other list because yeah, I mean, they, they're not showing their, their influences at all. And they're not showing their, but you know, cor frosted cornflakes was, was above Cheerios. So there's normal Cheerios and then frosted cornflakes was above that. I so the only there. difference between those two things is the sugar. So more sugar made this thing better, which I guess is, you know, telling you where the canned peaches and watermelon uh, uh, <laughs> scores are coming from. Just insane, just insane. And then people listen to this garbage, you know, because, well, that's what the government says. I mean, they, they just oh, yeah. want the best for us, don't they? I'm like, I think we've, we've learned by now that, that no, no, actually, no, they don't. Uh, we should never assume that, um, you know, ever. The peaches, the peaches thing made me think of kids and what we do to kids. Um, yeah. and, and we wrote this sugar-free kids book a, few, a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, our kids have been raised this way. We just eat what we eat, you know, and uh, we always get the, oh, 
Yep. Maria gets beat up on TikTok all the time. Why don't you give the kids sugar? Like should they're, they're like braider. Like, why yeah. wouldn't you, why aren't you going to give them this? Uh, and, them cocaine. Like what's wrong? Yeah, with exactly. That? Like they, they just, it's, it's crazy. But uh, you know, I, I made this little kind of meme picture. It was our son eating this, you know, it had some vegetables, lots of protein in it. It was like a, a Asian stir fry kind of dish. Uh, and next to it said, uh, you know, are you sure keto's safe for kids? And then below that's like one of these pictures of like rainbow of Skittles and the crap a you know, <laughs> typical kid eats. And it's like uh, next to that, I put, let's let them be kids, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, this kind of all led into us doing this sugar-free kids book. And I did a lot of studying on this as well, but as far as, you know, kids biology and what they need and all that. And uh, what really I found was incredible is that um, first of all, kids need a ton of protein, right? Mm -hmm. And the, you know, amino acid, you can't build cells and stuff out of no amino acid. I mean, you got to have them, right? Um, but when you look at also when they're young and in infants, they have a huge brain, right? And this brain is an energy hog, right? And proportionally for an infant to an adult, their brain is much bigger proportionally to their body, right? And so mm -hmm. that's why actually a, a newborn, a baby is born with blood ketones of 0.5, even in a fed state. And they quickly within like one to two hours will go to 2.0 or 3.0 blood ketones because you need all this energy and that brain is an energy hog and it, and it loves to run on ketones. So while breastfed, a baby's always in ketosis, but suddenly this becomes a crazy diet, you know, once they're not breastfed anymore, right? Like you ask anybody, what's the best food for a baby? Breast milk. Mm -hmm. Well, breast milk has a lot of fat in it and it's got a decent amount of protein as well. And what, when you, what do we transition these kids to when they come off the bottle? Canned peaches and peas and it's, it's like fat, devoid of fat mm -hmm. and very low in protein. And all these anti-nutrient, you know, we basically are changing kids to a, practically a vegetarian diet in a lot of cases. But if you go to the, you know, crap that you get in a can for babies, it's just insane to me. I mean, it's, they need fats for their brain. They need protein to grow. Yeah. And, and high sugar. I mean, that's the thing because a lot of these, yeah. these, you yeah. know, pea paste, all that sort of stuff is disgusting. And, you know, yeah. and you have to, you have to cover it up with, it, with a lot of sugar. Yeah. You got to add sugar to make it palatable. So you, a lot of that, most of that's just loaded with sugar too. Yeah, exactly. And my, and, and that's the thing, you know, kids' braids are growing and they really need those, those fats and, and ketones. Ketones can cross the blood brain barrier and reconstitute into fatty acids. And that's actually the structural component of the brain uh, is, is coming from that. So you actually really need ketones, but and yeah. cholesterol is the brain yeah. is the biggest source of cholesterol in the body. Yeah, exactly. And, and obviously for hormonal development and maintenance as well. And so this is, I think this is most vital when, when kids are growing, when kids are developing, you have to, you don't have the substrate. They, they will not develop the physical structures uh, to their genetic potential that they would have otherwise. And that, then that, and then that's it. That's permanent. They don't, they can, they can maintain and optimize what they've what they've developed into but they will never develop further they will never develop what they could have done which i think is is a shame and a crime exactly like i said all sex hormones are derived from cholesterol and yeah. so you know if you're not getting in the diet the liver's got to make it and it's a that can really put a load on the liver and i mean i'd rather get some eggs and get some cholesterol in my diet and uh give my liver a break and feed my brain you know yeah and uh, what people don't realize as well, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't have fat at all in our house. My dad was doing the whole Pritikin thing where it's just like no, no heart healthy fat, everything, everything, everything was, was also no sugar though. And so that was probably a, a saving grace. And so, but my mom, I remember telling me, it was like, well, when kids are young, you, we would always drink, um, you know, non-fat milk, but which I actually really liked. And, um, but he said, when, when kids are young, they should have whole milk because it's good for their brain. So even then, you know, they're aware of that. Well, kids should have fat. And then all of a sudden something changes, but it doesn't really, you know, we, what we use to build our bodies and our brains, we now need to use to maintain the structures of our brain and our body. You still need those ketones to go into your brain and to fuel your brain and to, and to rebuild these structures and maintain them. And so when we have people you know, getting older, getting Alzheimer's. And, you know, we look at MRIs all the time 
in you know my work and of, of the brain and you always see people that are older their brain's shriveled it's like a shriveled walnut whereas like a kid's brain is packed in you there's no space it's just it's just full of brain and and then we get older and it's just like oh these are these are normal age-related uh atrophy and it's just like and every time i see that i'm like how can that be normal that is i mean they've lost half the volume of their brain they're half the person that they used to be that that is tragic you know, so I was yeah. like, that, that can't be right. And I think that's why we were not maintaining our brains. We're not maintaining the structures uh, that we have spent so much energy and time building. And, and that's one of the major ones is, is continuing to provide the, the fats and cholesterol that we need to build and maintain our brain. Absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, for a long time, I've, I've uh, believed that Alzheimer's is essentially dementia is type three diabetes. It's yeah. insulin resistance of the brain. And what happens when you can't use burn glucose in the ba- brain as well, it atrophies, right? And, and ketones are the other source of fuel that can really fuel the brain. And that's why you really see brains of people with Alzheimer's and dementia wake up when yeah. they start getting, you know, more blood ketones in the body uh, from eating keto or carnivore. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, um, yeah, exactly right. You know, it, there was a study looking at that and they found that treat, people with full-blown Alzheimer's using a ketogenic, high-fat ketogenic diet as a treatment model for people with Alzheimer's, they found that it was, uh, they had better outcomes than every single Alzheimer's medication ever trialed. Wow. And, yeah, which is which is I think pretty incredible, and the fact that more people don't know that and aren't saying, okay, well, why don't we why don't we do this? Um, Doing it, right? I think it's like a shame. The, back to the same thing, like a medicate high priced medication that you got to take forever versus just eat these foods instead of these foods, and it doesn't really cost you anymore. <laughs> like, you know, it's just crazy that we don't do that more. Yeah, I think so, and um, you know, there are, and, and it would benefit it would benefit a lot of these these. Um, you know, basically treatment facilities that have end stage Alzheimer's, Parkinson's patients, uh, you yeah. get them on this sort of diet, it will actually help them. And you may, you know, knock on wood, potentially get these people home as opposed to being sort of end stage terminal cases that have gone to this hospice sort of um, facility to, yeah. you know, to die, basically. And uh, it's very, very sad when they get to that point. But it could help them, it could help these people. And, um, and so I think that's, that's something that it would be great to get more people on board with, you know, I mean, there's even, even studies looking at, um, higher saturated fat diets and higher LDL cholesterol, just people with higher LDL cholesterol have lower rates of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Yeah. You know, what are we doing here? (laughs) This is, you know, this this is such a major, major issue. You know, I, I don't, you know, when, when I, you know, talk to my parents, my, you know, my, my grandparents, when they were still around. When they were kids, no one had dementia, no one had Alzheimer's, no one was going to these old folks' homes. Now it's the only thing you do. Now it's just like you get to a certain age, mom, you know, grandma's going to a home. You know, that that's it, you know. And I was even told in medical school, if you live long enough, everyone will get Alzheimer's. And I just thought, uh, that doesn't sound right because I have relatives that were born in the 1800s that lived over 100 years. They died at home, fully compass mentis. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, uh, Maria's uh, grandma on one side, she always had her lard next to the, you know, she cooked in lard. She always ate her eggs and all this stuff and never had any cognitive issues. She, at like 70 some years old, she opened the door to the basement thinking it was a closet or something, stepped, fell all the way down the stairs. Uh, I think she was 73 or something. Didn't break a bone. Jeez. Wow. Okay. She, Good. <laughs> had, you know, I, oh, yeah, I know. I was, it was, God. It was a while ago. This is quite a while ago, but uh, you know, the sheath of the bones and the, mm. you know, all the protein and the, the fats that make those up and keep them healthy. Uh, you know, I, I, we've just gone and in there on the other side, tragically, her grandma died of Alzheimer's, mm. but, you know, her, her husband, my, uh, wife's grandfather uh died at like 60 of a heart attack wow. and so she was margarine and you know avoiding you know cholesterol in the diet and all down that path mm-hmm. for ever since her husband died because that's what she was told right yeah and she ended up with alzheimer's and so i don't think that's a coincidence no i don't think so either and, and you know the prevalence of these of these issues have gone 
sky high. They've all increased dramatically since the recommendation that we stop eating fat and cholesterol and we stop eating animal fats. And so we go on this low fat, heart healthy diet. And first of all, heart attack rates have tripled. So that didn't work. And, uh, and also Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and, uh, you know, other, other forms of dementia have increased dramatically since then. So I think that we are, we are really, really, really hurting ourselves, uh, by doing this and, you know, people in, you know, in, in you know, young adulthood or, or, or middle age, you know, you're in, in the prime of adulthood, you, you, you can, you can get away with a lot more. Um, the extremes of age, obviously developing, you will never develop properly unless you eat properly. Uh, and then you're, you're stuck the rest of your life. Um, but also, you know, when you get older, you, you just sort of run out of options. You've, you've built up a lot of damage over the years and you haven't been maintaining things and things are, you know, the, the wheels are starting to fall off. You don't have as much room to mess around. And so it's, it's very important, but before you ever get there, you know, before the wheels fall off in the first place, you know, you can, you can keep and maintain your body and your brain so that it doesn't become a problem that you have, you're having to chase at that point. Exactly. And I, it, it is something that we need to invest more time in, even as parents early on to educate our kids on what is the right thing, because, you know, that was the thing that really uh, drive me crazy too. Like uh, in our book, we tried to talk about this is something you need to teach your kids about. You you spend so yeah. much money and time on sports and on, you know, education and all of these things, which are great, but we don't talk to our kids about nutrition. We don't talk to them about what's healthy, what food is. You know, we, I, you always see these shows where like, I think it was Jamie Oliver did a thing and these kids are addicted to French fries and all that stuff. And he holds a potato out and they don't know what it is. <laughs> we eat french fries all day long but they don't know what a potato is when they see it right like you gotta we gotta teach our kids what is healthy you know kids don't magically just turn 18 and suddenly boom okay now i know how to eat healthy you know i spent all my life eating candy and letting letting them be kids and eating junk and now suddenly they go off to college and they're just gonna figure it out like we gotta give them the tools we gotta educate them and if if you want to do something good for your kid give them lifelong health. And that's going to be way more important than any sport or anything else you invest time and money into. Yeah, definitely. I was, I was lucky that I, that I did have that. My mom always, my mom was an amazing cook. I'll definitely show her your cookbooks because, you know, she, she literally, she has well over 500 cookbooks. She has read all of them. She has used all of them. Like she just, she loves cooking. She just loves, you know, just the, the, you know, the experience of it, you know, the, the chemistry experiment of, of putting all these things together and making something wonderful. And she, uh, that was a big, that was a big hit for her going carnivore, because she's just like, I can't cook anything. And she was really bummed out by that. But now she's looking at different carnivore options and things like that and adjusting. Like that was one thing when, when she married my dad, when they, with, they were married in their early twenties, my mom was cooking all these like Julia child recipes and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and then it was just like, Oh my God, fat's bad for you. You got to get rid of all this stuff. And she was never able to cook her Julia child recipes again. She was so sad because she like loved these oh, things. And, yeah. and I told her then I was just like, Hey, you can do, you know, modified Julia child now. She's like, yes. Yeah. And she was all happy with that. But, you know, I always, always grew up, we always grew up watching her cook she, you know she was she was an amazing cook and so we knew what food was we knew how to prepare things and we were we were taught that but we were taught the pritikin style of of healthy eating which is, you know and which is like meat we definitely meat you know you wanted sort of everything you know you wanted your, your meat your protein uh and your your greens and you wanted your starches like that's how we were and lean you know that was that was eating good and so we we ate good you know uh from that standpoint uh, there really wasn't ever any sugar things in, in our house just ever, which never had soda, even juice. That was very rare. And, yeah. um, you know, so that, 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 I, that was, a, that was a good foundation for me, but now I just, you know, so now I always had that in, in my head. Like I wanted to eat well, I wanted to eat things that were good for me and be healthy. Uh, but now I've just sort of readjusted what that means to me. And so I, I, I agree with you. That was a very, very helpful to me. If I didn't have that basis, I, I wouldn't be able to have made the conclusions and, that I've drawn uh, since then. Yeah. And just the, the whole cooking process and everything, getting kids involved in that and understanding what goes into their food. And, uh, you know, end of every one of our videos on YouTube, Maria has our son, if he's helping, 
uh, he always ends with cook with your kids because you know that gets them involved. It gets them. Uh, they they tend to be more. They they want to try something too. Like if they got had a hand in making it, they want to try mm-hmm. it. You know and see the results too. So uh, that's a great way to get them involved. If there's something that you're not sure they're going to want to like, have them help help you cook it. Um, so yeah, I, I big believer in that. Yeah, and also you know they you know this is this is a real skill that uh yeah. that have, has been lost in most of the adult population now i think that's probably part and parcel with this whole you know food industry takeover of of our health is that they've they've made these hyper palatable easy to make ready made meals that are actually uh, originally they were cheaper than the constituent parts that you would buy on your own so it was like well okay what's the point why I'm going to buy all these ingredients myself, spend three hours cooking it and it costs more, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, they just went to that and then, yeah. And then you have an entire generation or two now not seeing their parents cook, not learning how to cook and they have no idea. So now they're beholden to that and they're always going out to eat, going out to restaurants, buying all these things. I had, I had friends of mine, you know, who have, or were having kids, they've never cooked a meal in their life. And like, and like talking to them about this and they're, and they literally like every day is Uber Eats every day for you know, three meals a day for, you know, them and their kid is, is Uber Eats. And, and I'm telling them, it's like, Hey, well, this is, you know, and they were like, yeah, yeah. You know, like whenever they were, you know, would, would be visiting or whatever, they see what, you know, I was eating. They're like, yeah, I wish I could do that. I just, I don't know how to shop. I don't know what to buy. I was like, just buy meat. You just, 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 that's it. But you know, it, yeah, salt just, that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, just buy a steak, cook the steak. How do you not know how to cook a steak? It's three minutes. It's done. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, exactly. Well, and that's the thing too, is it can be a lot quicker, a lot easier. Mm-hmm. I mean, by the time you order it and you, or if, if Uber Eats is one thing, but if you go to the place to pick it up and drive back, you could have grilled the steak, ate it and cleaned up and it would have cost less too. So, yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. And it's a steak, you know, yeah. like you're getting, you, you might get some fajitas for that. You know, it's like the, like the, you know, it's, it's, it's a much, much better quality meal as well. Yeah, exactly. Great. Well, awesome. Well, Craig, thank you so much for taking the time. It was, it was absolutely great talking to you. That was, that was a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, I had a and, great time. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that uh, people get a lot, a lot out of that. And um can you tell us where to find you and uh, and Maria's work and to to learn more about you and also find find your book? That's something I wanted to talk about more. But um, you know, I think that's great that you're coming out with with those carnivore ideas because that's something that that so many people ask me is like, well, what what recipes do I cook? For me, it's simple. It's just just cook a damn steak. But like, but some people need more than that, and so that's great yeah. that you come out with that. Well, and that's what my wife Maria is so amazing at is she creates these recipes and she's like like you talked about the chemistry experiment. You know, one of the things is uh, this pudding that she started, which was originally started with my son, Kai, who's right over here, uh, who did not eat eggs. And we tried everything when he was a bit when he was young to get him to eat eggs because we knew how good healthy they were for him and how good they were for his brain and everything. And he wouldn't eat. We scrambled over. You name it. Hard boiled. Nothing. So she started um, experimenting and throwing it in some hard boiled eggs in a blender. And she put some cocoa powder in there, a little bit of sweetener blended it up and it turned into the best chocolate mousse you've ever had starting with hard boiled eggs, right? And people still can't believe that recipe. Uh, Holly Berry did a little live cooking video with, with oh, wow. my wife. Very cool. They did that recipe, And before she's like, uh, uh, we're on the live like this. And she's like, Maria, I'm not eating pudding made from hard boiled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> by the end, you know, when it's done, she's taken out the whole thing. She's like, this is like ganache. It's so good. But uh, you know, that's the thing, you know, thinning the ingredients and techniques and the little chemistry experiment is what she's so good at. Uh, She's got a a bread that's just from eggs with uh, egg white powder, you know, different things like that. uh, I think can really make it uh, a lot easier and approachable for more people. Mm. Um, But back to your original thing, uh, ketomaria.com. That's the best place to start. Just ketomaria.com has got links to our blog and all our books and all our social media, everything kind of one place there. Awesome. We'll put that up in the in the description as well. I didn't know you guys did something with Halle Berry. Does she she doing keto or what is she doing? Yeah, she's a di- she's a type two diabetic and she's been doing okay. she's been eating low carb for like seven eight years. Yeah. Oh wow. We did a couple of videos with her and did some other stuff too. It's pretty cool. Which she's is- really really cute. 
that's really cool. Yeah. Let's see if we can get her on the, on the carnivore. I think I did see something about her, you know, doing, doing some sort of, you know, dietary thing. And that's how she's, you know, that's her, her Hollywood secret into, you know, staying young and things like that. That'd be cool. Is she, yeah. she doing mostly, mostly keto or is she carnivore ish? Yeah. -ish? yeah. Uh, she, she's been doing keto. Like I said, probably seven, eight years. She's got all our books and that's yeah. Awesome. she's. Been yeah. Well, that's really cool. Well, that's, that's fun to see. And the, you know, the more people, in those in those circles that are obviously very influential and people look up to and admire and then say like okay well Holly you know she must be in her I guess fifties by now and still looks like she did when she was in her twenties you know so like people look at that and just be like okay well I'll, whatever she's doing let's do that yeah. <laughs> for sure yeah very uh, we're good. very much in the, we we are very much in the rising tide lifts all boats you know the more people that under, hear about this and see what it can do the better for everyone yeah i'm i'm, I'm right there with you great awesome awesome well, great thank you so much i hope we I hope we can do this again yeah awesome thank you